The following video is a video that I worked very hard on for like weeks to meet a deadline, to meet the deadline for the 20th anniversary of Napoleon Dynamite. And I actually managed to get it done early, but it did not make it through copyright and it got pulled. So I made some edits to it to try and kind of circumnavigate those issues. So part of that editing is me making the whole review in black and white aside from a few frames, as well as slowing most of the footage and making a few cuts from my original video. So yeah, this review is gonna be a little bit kinda choppy. It's not perfect. I had to make the changes I wanted to make because I really want this video on my channel, but Paramount just was like not happy with what I did. So enjoy the re-edited version of my Napoleon Dynamite 20th anniversary video. If I had to guess what year I became who I was going to be for the rest of my life, I would say that 2004 was probably my formative year. 2004, 2005 probably, but more so 2004. The year 2004 was a very interesting year. It definitely feels like the year where we finally started to get over 9-11. The war in Iraq was still going on, George W. Bush got re-elected, and we saw the release of such films as Spider-Man 2, Alien vs. Predator, The Passion of the Christ, as well as some of the best video games of all time, such as Grand Theft Auto San Andreas and Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door. Fun fact, Valve has actually been using the Half-Life 2 engine to make games for over 20 years at this point. New Metal had died post-hardcore indie rock and emo were starting to hit the mainstream, and we were all awaiting the end of the Star Wars prequel trilogy. Yeah, 2004 is a really special year for me. I would have been 12 going on 13, and statistically speaking, around the age of 12 or 13 is when a person really develops their personality, their principles, and pretty much most of the traits you have now as an adult started showing up when you're around 12 or 13 years old. While they may have underwent some changes, and while you have matured and even changed as a person, at your core, you right now are some variation of the person you were at the age of 12 or 13. It's the age in which you really became yourself. With that being said, 2004 was probably one of, if not the most important years of my young life for many reasons. I think 2004 was the year that I truly started to develop my love of film. To give one film credit for developing my love of film would be asinine. There are like tens of films I could easily give credit to. But out of all of those, I think the movie that left the biggest impression on me would be Clerks. And the film that I watched that made me realize that, hey, one day I could do this was Haggard. But nevertheless, whenever the idea of writing a movie comes to mind, like a comedy or a whatever, the film that I would base my film off of, at least in terms of presentation, is 2004's Napoleon Dynamite. Napoleon Dynamite is a a true success story in the film industry, but before I get into it, let's talk about something I actually was unaware of going into this video. Two years prior to the release of Napoleon Dynamite, John Heater and Jared Hess, while still in film school, created a nine-minute short film titled Palooka, which is Spanish for wig. It features a nerdy teenager named Seth who attends high school and gets bullied quite a bit, but his friend Pedro stands up for him. At lunch, Pedro and Seth notice that Giel is wearing his hood, and it's revealed that Giel shaved his head because his hair was making his head hot and now he's embarrassed about being bald. So the group decide to cut class and go to a thrift store after winning 10 bucks on a lotto ticket. The part where Seth can't get the ticket and he sends Giel in and Giel gets it because he has a mustache actually made me laugh pretty hard. When they go to the thrift store, they find a wig for $7, and Seth is briefly conflicted because he wants a new fanny pack, but the fanny pack costs $5. In the end, however, he decides to do the right thing and get Giel the wig, running off or tripping into the sunset at the end. Peluca is 100% a student film, but it is a very well-constructed student film at that. Simple premise, funny gags, and interesting characters. Anyone who's seen Napoleon Dynamite can see how they ended up recycling or reworking a lot of the gags in the overall dynamic from this in Napoleon Dynamite years later. 
But that's just kind of how film works. As it stands, you can look at Palooka as kind of like a sizzle reel or a pitch short for what would later become Napoleon Dynamite. And I think it's funny that Seth, being a nerdy outcast, gets along with Pedro and Giel, who would be outcast in Idaho for being Hispanic. It kind of channels like Beavis and Butthead, but if it was shot like Clerks, that's the feeling I get from it, especially because John Heater as Napoleon Dynamite kind of looks like Butthead. Palooka was screened at the Slamdance Film Festival in 2003, and it got such a good reception that Jared Hess's friend Jeremy Kuhn told him he should drop out of film school and just try to make a movie using the short film as a pitch. Jared Hess would team up with, I guess, his wife or girlfriend, I don't know if they were married at this point, to create a script. And with Peluca kind of being used as a pitch, they started talking to investors and producers. From what I've read, it seemed like a lot of potential investors just didn't get it, and the ones that did had some pretty wild requests. One investor wanted to remove John Heater and replace him with Jake Gyllenhaal. And keep in mind, this was like 2002-2003, when Gyllenhaal was pretty much becoming a brand name actor. Despite this, Jared Jared Hess was very hardline on having Heater reprise his role as he didn't think anybody else could bring this character to life, the Seth character who had been transformed into Napoleon Dynamite. There were a few other kind of mid-tier names that could have been in this movie. Jason Lee, Brad Garrett, and Vincent Gallo were all offered the part of Uncle Rico, but declined. Nevertheless, after all the deliberation and finding investors, the movie was granted a budget of $400,000. It's like a dollar an hour. Principal photography took place in Hess's hometown of Preston, Idaho, and the town was very accommodating, even letting the cast and crew stay in certain homes in the town. It was shot over the course of 23 days in July of 2003. The character of Seth was changed into Napoleon Dynamite. Both Pedro and Giel were merged into one character who was played by actor Efren Ramirez, and a few supporting characters were added, such as Napoleon's grandma, played by the woman who would later play Max's mom on It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. I smell like shit. We would be introduced to his brother Kip, played by Aaron Rule. Napoleon, don't be jealous that I've been chatting online with babes all day. And then we had Debbie, played by the little shitball from Waterworld. And of course, how could I forget Uncle Rico, played by John Grease, someone who has showed up on this channel quite a few times, and I've referred to him as Uncle Rico. That That's why he's in the movie, he plays Rico. The movie itself is not like a giant spectacle or anything, it's an independent film through and through, but it has a certain look and a certain sense of humor, and the actors play characters that are so out there yet so grounded at the same time. It is truly one of the few one-of-a-kind comedy movies out there. Peluca reminded me a little bit of Clerks, as I mentioned, maybe because it was in black and white and used the same font for the credits, but Napoleon Dynamite doesn't really channel anything. There's nothing I can really compare it to, and we're gonna get to that later because that's actually kind of a funny point, but Napoleon Dynamite is like 99.5% unique in most ways, and I think that has everything to do with why it was so successful. I'm not going to play by play this movie because anyone clicking this video has likely seen the movie and anybody who hasn't I don't want to spoil too much. I don't need to break down the whole thing like beat by beat. Like certain movies I do that because I'm doing like funny commentary over it but in this one nah I can just kind of go through some points, talk about it, and then we'll go over my experiences with it. And honestly I don't even think this movie can be spoiled because it's one of those movies where you could beat for beat describe everything that happens in this movie to a person who's never seen it and they'll have no idea what the fuck you're talking about. It's really not a story driven experience in the traditional sense. So like I'm just gonna go ahead and say because this movie's pretty much indescribable if you haven't seen it pause this video go pull one of the streaming services up and watch it first. When they were creating this movie Napoleon wasn't supposed to be like a 100% relatable character at least not on the surface level. He's awkward, he's developmentally stunted, and he's weird. He has a lot of strange quirks. In his introductory scene we see him tying like a He-Man toy to a string and dragging it outside the bus for no no apparent reason. He's clearly a social outcast, and he definitely lives in a world of his own. Like, he's speaking in front of the class for, like, a current events assignment, and, like, I don't know if this is supposed to imply that he's making something up, or if he's, like, reading the weekly world news, but he comes up with a whole current events thing that's complete bullshit. Last week, Japanese scientists explace, place explosive detonators at the bottom of Lake Loch Ness, to blow Nessie out of the water. 
I think the implication here is that Napoleon isn't confident in himself in any aspect, so he has to make up lies to make himself seem more interesting. But the problem is, because Napoleon is Napoleon, the lies that he's making are so batshit crazy that it just kind of pushes him further away from social interaction. What'd you do all last summer again? I told you, I spent it with my uncle in Alaska, hunting wolverines. Many have theorized that Napoleon is somewhere on the autism spectrum because of his behavior and his inability to pick up on certain social cues. In the movie, it's played pretty tastefully. They don't really go too far with it. They don't go full the good doctor with it. I am retarded. If Napoleon is supposed to be on the spectrum, he's like low on the spectrum, but he's on it enough where like you can kind of just tell. Napoleon Dynamite is a 16 year old who likes ninjas, martial arts, mythical creatures, and is often the subject of laughter by the other more quote unquote normal kids, such as Don the Jock. As a character, he's weird and awkward enough that you don't feel bad laughing at him, but he's likable enough that you don't particularly want bad things to happen to him, and even if you can't totally relate to him, you do feel bad for him when bad things happen. For example, when he decides to ask Trisha to the dance, and she only ends up going with him because his uncle told her mom that Napoleon is basically retarded and wets the bed. Which basically causes Trisha's mom to force Trisha to let Napoleon take her to the dance, which that's just like kind of mean to do. But there's no way Trisha's gonna be able to be like, Mom, I'm not going, he's weird, because her mom thinks Napoleon's mentally challenged. Having seen this movie when I was starting to hit puberty and starting to become interested in girls and trying to figure out that little hurdle, like how to quote, ask a girl out, end quote. This whole little sequence is just so fucking cringe to me. It's probably the first time I remember watching something and being like, oh no, like cringing. He decides to draw like a portrait of her, but the portrait looks really fucked up. And then when she reluctantly calls him to say that she's gonna go to the dance with him, he starts with the backhanded compliments. I want to thank you for the beautiful drawing you did of me. It's hanging in my bedroom. Really? Took me like three hours to finish the shading on your upper lip. It's probably the best drawing I've ever done. Yeah, it's really nice. I think the thing is here with Napoleon is like, yeah, he's kind of stunted. He's definitely a late bloomer. I wouldn't be surprised if he was asexual because he shows Pedro that picture of the model saying it's his girlfriend, but I don't think he's actually interested in girls. I think he's just interested in like fitting in and being a normal teenager who fits in usually means that you have a girlfriend or a date to the dance. It's like he wants these things solely to appear normal and not because he actually wants them. Them. And I think that actually makes it very interesting because this kind of does turn the whole coming of age thing on its head. He doesn't get a ride to the dance because Uncle Rico's doing his business thing, so he starts to run to Trisha's house and then Pedro's cousins, these random cholos, pick him up. And him picking Trisha up in this low rider is pretty awkward, but then they get to the dance and what does Trisha do the first chance she gets? She ditches him because she doesn't want to be in this situation. She wants to go with her friends. She probably wanted to go with a boy who wasn't Napoleon. And yeah, it's just sad, you feel kind of bad for him when this happens, but he doesn't seem all that bothered by it. It could be that he just doesn't know how to process it, or he is secretly hurt deep down, but he's hiding it. But I also kind of get the feeling that he really doesn't care all that much, because he only asked her out so that he could appear to be normal. It's not like he had a crush on this girl. To paraphrase some interviews I saw for this, Napoleon's arc is a coming-of-age story, but completely subverted and turned on its head. Usually with this kind of arc, at the end, the main character gets the girl and the kiss, but nobody wants to kiss Napoleon, and really we can't be sure that Napoleon is actually interested in girls like on that level. Basically the coming of age aspect for Napoleon is much like the song of the beginning states making friends. We see him at the beginning he doesn't really have friends he's just looked at as this weird kid who says weird things likely to try and make himself seem more interesting but the lies that he makes up are so ridiculous that everybody just thinks he's fucking whack. By going out of his shell just a little bit and maybe dialing back on the lies a bit he ends the school year better than he started it. He made two friends with Debbie and Pedro. And one thing I kind of noticed on a rewatch is, you know how he starts the movie coming up with these ridiculous lies? It kind of dials back as the movie goes forward, in a very subtle sense. He's still that weird kid that's obsessed with ligers and ninjas and fantasy, but he's downplaying it a bit. He's learning to be himself more. 
they always tell you just be yourself to make friends, and I do think that works to a degree unless you're a completely unlikable person. And Napoleon, being a weird, unlikable, and off-putting person, manages to become a better version of himself throughout the events of the movie, and therefore he starts making friends. And I think that arc is so much better than just your standard high school romance arc. And they took a big risk by making this the arc rather than just kind of giving into temptation and going for a regular love story. And for those of you who, like, might be too young to remember, or, like, you just don't remember, or whatever, there was a point in time where literally every comedy, like, had this dynamic. They do play a little bit to the dynamic, like, there is a third act breakup, but there wasn't really a relationship to begin with, so it's like a friend breakup. But, like, every fucking comedy movie in the late 90s and early 2000s, it was guy gets girl, guy fumbles girl, guy gets girl back. And I get that film and television has kind of like a standard flow to it. It needs to have ups and downs, but they did it the same every fucking time. John Heater plays the character of Napoleon pretty much perfectly. Like, it, I could not picture anybody else portraying this character. And that's very rare, because even some of the most iconic characters in, like, media, I can picture somebody else taking a crack at it and it possibly working. But I could not picture anybody else in the world that could portray Napoleon. Napoleon. As with most of the movie and characters, Napoleon is such an out there character, but also very grounded at the same time. It would be a stretch to say that you probably grew up with someone like Napoleon, but it wouldn't be too far out to say that Napoleon kind of takes traits from all sorts of weird people you knew growing up and just stuffs them all into one person. And in some ways, if you're a little bit weird like me, there might be the odd trait about him that you yourself relate to, at least when looking back on your childhood. It's relatable, and it's a very standard character, the quirky comedy movie character, but it's played up to a point where it's very unique. The way he talks, his voice. What are you gonna do today, Napoleon? Whatever I feel like I wanna do. Gosh! His mannerisms, his facial expressions, or lack thereof. This character is just perfectly developed in every conceivable way. You don't know that much about him, but you don't need to know that much about him. You're gonna learn everything you need to learn about this character throughout the course of the movie. And that's like writing 101. You want to make sure your audience gets your character, but with as little explanation as possible. All we know going into it is he's a weird kid, he has an older brother, he lives with his grandma, and he's in the Pacific Northwest. And it just goes from there. But as strong of a main character as Napoleon Dynamite is, actor Rutger Hauer once said that a main character is only as strong as his supporting cast. Disclaimer, Rutger Hauer never said such a thing. I believe part of the reason why Napoleon Dynamite was so well received initially and why it's had two decades of popularity is not only because of the Napoleon Dynamite character, but because of the side characters. By far my favorite supporting characters, and I'm pretty sure most people would agree with me, are Napoleon's brother Kip and Uncle Rico. Both of them have their own things going on, but they also have a side plot where they're working together. Kip wants to bring his online girlfriend to Preston, Idaho, and Uncle Rico wants to make Napoleon's life a living hell for, like, no apparent reason. And together, the two work on what is essentially a get-rich-quick scheme. Uncle Rico moves into the house after Napoleon's grandma gets injured while riding an ATV at the sand dunes, and both him and Kip embark on selling Tupperware door to door, which does lead to some pretty funny moments. Uncle Rico is like essentially Al Bundy, but if he was a much bigger loser, he's so hung up on high school and his would have been football career. <sighs> Coach would have put me in fourth quarter, we'd have been state champions, no doubt. No doubt my mind. Like, Al Bundy was a loser, but Al Bundy owned a house, had a pretty hot wife, and a hot daughter. Rico doesn't have any of that. Rico is divorced and lives in his van. Uncle Rico is the typical bitter ex-athlete character, but cranked up to 11. Some of his behavior borders on delusion and psychosis. <laughs> How much you want to make a bet I can throw a football over the mountains? To the point where he actually goes on eBay to buy a time machine so he can go back and get himself put in the high school football game he felt he could have won. Of course, this movie is rooted in reality, so no, it's not a time machine. It's just some weird device that zaps your testicles. Oh. 
Turn off! Turn off! Shit. Rico's very interesting because on the surface he's just a one-dimensional shitty uncle character who's bitter about not becoming a pro football player. But if you watch what he's doing and the way he acts, this is a man who is just severely unhappy with his life. As soon as grandma gets injured, Rico kind of just barges into the household and he helps himself to all the steak and he immediately ropes Kip into his little get-rich-quick scheme. But the way he treats Napoleon can be interpreted in several different ways. He still wits the bed and everything. You're kidding. Way number one, he just simply does not like Napoleon, and Napoleon doesn't like him, and he just wants to treat him like garbage. But then you kind of factor in the fact that he's really hung up on high school because of how shitty his life is, and it makes me think there's two possibilities. Possibility one is that he's trying to kind of relive being like a high school jock by bullying his nephew. It's just a way of him to chase childhood highs and try to make himself feel a little bit better about the fact that he is divorced and he lives in a van down by the river. The other interpretation I may have had here is that Rico was probably a lot like Napoleon back in the day. Clearly the weirdness and the delusions runs in the family, like you have Kip thinking he's gonna be a cage fighter, you have Napoleon talking about ninjas and shit. If I had to guess, Uncle Rico was kind of a social outcast in high school, but he was on the football team. However, maybe in his own mind he thinks if he wasn't such a social outcast he might have been put in the big game, or he might have done better with his football career. Oh, and you know we can't afford the fun pack. What do you think, money grows on trees in this family? Take it back! So essentially, I think there's a distinct possibility that Uncle Rico treats Napoleon the way he treats Napoleon because he sees a little bit of himself in Napoleon from when he was a teenager. And that brings up all sorts of feelings of self-loathing and regret, so he lashes out at Napoleon. Again, this movie leaves things so open that you can really interpret it as many ways as you want. Another side of Rico we get to see later, and I don't know if he's like this because he's actually a pervert or if he's purposely trying to make Napoleon look bad, is he gets really weird. After the whole Tupperware thing, he starts selling breast enlargement. And essentially, he's giving the flyers to girls from Napoleon's school, which, like, I think somebody might get fucking put on a sex offender registry for trying to do that. When he gives the flyers to Deb, he purposely mentions that Napoleon said she might be interested. So I think this whole thing was him trying to sabotage Napoleon, but the way it's like shot and the way he gets all close up to her, it looks like he's about to like, you know, make this movie get real fucking dark. He obviously doesn't do anything, but like, they knew what they were doing. They knew what they were channeling when they shot this. Whatever interpretation you have of the Uncle Rico character, he gets his comeuppance at the end of the movie, and it's pretty funny. Come here, boy! However, Kip Dynamite is also a very memorable character. He's Napoleon's older brother, and he kind of steals the show from Napoleon in a way. Kip is just a weird, slightly effeminate nerd who spends all of his time on the computer with his online girlfriend. He ends up joining Rico's Get Rich Quick scheme because he desires to meet his online girlfriend in person. Kip Dynamite is interesting in that he's very similar to Napoleon, but also very different. He has some of the same verbal tics. Jeez! But he's a lot more effeminate, and he's a very different person from Napoleon. He's a dork, but he's like, he's got a mean streak to him. Trying to earn money for college. Your mom goes to college. Much like Napoleon, he wishes to be a tough guy, but he just simply can't be a tough guy. He doesn't get as much screen time as even Uncle Rico, which is kind of a shame because he's really good. Aaron Rule just really became the character. Throughout the movie, Kip is talking about his online girlfriend, and he mentions that she's only ever sent a face picture, which in the world of online dating, that's a pretty big risk to take. It's built up, everybody's like, oh, what's she gonna look like? You know, is she gonna be fat? Is she gonna be, like, you know, deformed or crippled or ugly? But when she finally shows up, like, she's not super hot or anything, but she's not ugly. The humor with the whole Kip LaFonda thing is that she is a tall African-American woman from Detroit, and Kip is a skinny white guy from Idaho. It's an 
odd couple situation, but at the end of the movie in the post credit scene, they get married, so it works out. I do think it's a little bit corny that he kind of just adopts this gangsta image at the end of the movie. It's like, okay, it's funny, but it seems kind of lazy to me. But when he does transition to this persona, he does actually give Napoleon some useful advice, so I guess it kind of falls under character growth that he's more free with himself in this persona. Peace out. While I love Uncle Rico, the Kip character was undeniably one of the most popular characters in the movie. Kip Dynamite was so fucking popular when this movie was hot that there were rumors of him getting his own spin-off movie with him and his online girlfriend, LaFonda. Which, I think that would have actually been really funny if done right. It's a shame that it was likely just vaporware or like an urban legend. Dang it! It's a damn shame though because Kip is so entertaining and you gotta give Kip a little bit of credit for having maxed out his riz to the point that he'd just be pulling baddies off the AOL chat rooms. Alright, yeah, I can't do Zoomer speak. I won't do it again. Yes, I will. There are a couple supporting characters outside of Napoleon's family, and I hate to say this because this is what the movie's focus is on, but I find the high school supporting cast, Pedro and Debbie, just really aren't all that interesting compared to Kip and Rico. Like, yeah, Pedro has a few funny parts here and there, and it's really funny that he just has two cousins who who are total fucking cholos in the middle of the Pacific Northwest or Great Plains. I don't know which one Idaho is technically part of, but it always made me laugh that these two cholos were just like there. I think really the funniest thing about Pedro is his deadpan expression and delivery whenever he's around Napoleon, which is supplemented by his somewhat stereotypical Mexican accent. It really plays up on the fact that a Mexican guy in the middle of Idaho is about as much of an outcast as someone like Napoleon. Pedro's arc has him running for class president, and they put quite a bit of focus on this, but it's also as a means to show Napoleon's growth throughout the movie. Napoleon helps him out, and at the end, when Pedro botches his speech, Napoleon does his little dance number. And Pedro does become class president at the end, but it's like his story, like I said, is more so to supplement Napoleon's story. I guess that is the point of a supporting character. It's worth noting that they merge elements of the Giel character from Peluca into the Pedro character in this movie, and they even recycle the head shaving plotline from Palooka for a little bit in this movie. It's a sledgehammer. You got shocks, pegs, box, eggs, 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 eggs. <laughs> Debbie is the character I really don't understand. I mean, she doesn't really get enough to do in this movie, and I understand that there needs to be kind of a love interest and a female lead, or at least a female supporting character, but she isn't really Napoleon's love interest. She's just someone that he happens to befriend throughout the course of the film. She goes to the dance with Pedro, but that really doesn't go anywhere. And furthermore, when Debbie and Napoleon, you know, come into conflict with each other due to Rico's meddling, it's treated like a third act breakup, but a breakup of their platonic relationship. They kind of tease the idea that Napoleon might have a thing for her, but it also could just be him trying to make friends through his awkwardness. And it ultimately doesn't go in that direction at all, which I'm fine with, but I kind of wish they made her character a little bit more interesting. Some of the other high school kids who have small roles are pretty memorable. For the longest time, I thought the guy who played Don was related to Gary Busey. He has that animated Jake Busey face, but no, he's not a Busey. And I just love how douchey he looks when he's reacting to Napoleon. It's fucking hilarious because I knew kids that like kind of did that. And then Hilary Duff's sister plays Summer, who is your typical mean girl type character. But out of all the high school characters who are kind of just in the background, I think my favorite character is the one who returns from Peluca, Randy the Bully. Randy is kind of the character I wish got a little bit more screen time. He exists purely to make Napoleon's life a living hell. For example, Napoleon has tater tots in his pocket that he saved from lunch, and Randy demands them, and when he doesn't get them, he just kicks them in his pocket, and it's so ridiculous. It's ridiculous because because of how ridiculous it is that Napoleon would just stuff tater tots in his pocket and eat them later, which is like 100% like an autism thing. I knew an autistic kid that like put craft dinner in his pocket and like just started eating it. He was also fat. For some reason, like I always found it really funny when he's bullying this kid for his lunch money and he just grabs him by the neck and starts shaking him. And like me and my friends used to kind of do that. Like I would play along if I was getting my neck shook, whatever. We thought this was hilarious. But like anytime Randy's on screen, it's really fucking funny 
funny. He's just a one-dimensional bully character, and he is perfect at it. He's basically every stereotype in a high school bully rolled into one fat kid, and it's brilliant. There's a few characters I wish got a little bit more screen time, but there's one character who I think got the perfect amount of screen time for his very small role, and that's Diedrich Bader as karate instructor Rex, owner of the Rex Kwando Dojo in town. You'll be prepared to defend yourself with the strength of a grizzly, the reflexes of a puma, and the wisdom of a man. At the beginning of the movie, Kip wants to go to a free lesson after being pulled into town by Napoleon, which, my god, in order to try and follow up on his dream of becoming a cage fighter, and he just gets kind of slapped around and demeaned by Rex in front of everybody in the dojo. Bow to your sensei! Okay. Bader's voice that he uses for this, combined with Kip being a little worm, just makes every second of this scene so memorable. From when he tries to do his, like, sweep kick, to when Rex, like, berates him for not bowing to his sensei. He is literally the embodiment of, like, your typical, like, shopping mall martial arts instructor who likely knows his shit to some degree, but isn't exactly a model teacher, and borders on being a scam artist or a grifter. The opening credits in this movie were actually a last-minute addition because initially the movie just kind of started, but test audiences were confused about the movie, confused at what time period it takes place, and so forth. So to combat this, they did a very creative little opening credit sequence with hands moving food and other objects around, and we see Napoleon's school ID stating that the movie takes place in the 2004-2005 school year. Initially, this credit sequence was done with John Heater's hands, but the producers didn't like his hands because they were ugly and had hangnails, so they got a hand model to do it, but then some of the producers also did it. So the hands change around a bit, and honestly, that kind of just adds to the overall quirkiness of the movie on a higher level. And it makes this opening credits sequence all the more memorable. While every character that features in this movie is quirky in their own way, the actual setting itself is also quirky because it's explicitly stated that the movie takes place in 2004-2005, but all the music and the little, like, cultural references, what few there are, and the technology, and even how the movie itself is presented makes it seem like it takes place in the late 80s, early 90s. Kip is using like a dial-up, paper, whatever system for the internet. There's a top loader VCR. All of the music that plays in the movie is from the 80s or 90s, with the sole exception of the White Stripes song, We're Going to Be Friends, which only plays in the opening credits, so it's not in-universe. I grew up in like the largest city in my country, so like I don't really know what it's like to live out in a place like the Great Plains or the Pacific Northwest or the Midwest west or whatever. I've never lived in a truly rural area, but I know certain places that are away from major urban sprawls oftentimes are a few years back. If anybody from those parts of the world could confirm this with me, please leave a comment. But I do have one distinct memory of going up north with my friend to like Gravenhurst, Ontario to some big party his family was having, like a family reunion or something. And the house was like, it was old. It seemed like it was built in like the 40s, hadn't really been renovated since like the 70s and they had like rotary phones and shit and this was like in 2004 2005 I don't know if this was a stylistic choice or if this is just what Preston, Idaho is like, but it's totally anachronistic and it makes this movie even more timeless, oddly enough. I guess because it doesn't like root itself in the early to mid 2000s. I don't know if this statement makes any sense, but I think more people are familiar with the 80s and the early 90s as an era for media than they are with the 2000s. I get the feeling this stylistic choice to kind of utilize a more timeless era in the medium of film actually works to kind of keep the movie from aging itself. It sounds weird for me to say that, but that it makes sense when you look at it because like, you know, kids today even, they'll see something and they're like, oh, that's the 80s or that's the 90s. But if like a kid saw like, I don't know, LimeWire or something, they'd be like, what the fuck? The movie shies away from cultural references besides the weird A-team reference, which I always felt was a little bit out of place for this movie. The movie chooses to stay away from political satire and current events stuff, which kind of helps it even more to keep from aging. There's no scene where Napoleon is just like, George Bush is a freaking idiot. And really it's all humor centered around being an awkward teen or living in a rural part of the Pacific Northwest or the odd physical or visual gag. Some of the jokes they do in this movie are set up very well and they're funny as shit. Like Napoleon working at the farm and asking, 
Do the chickens have large talons? And the old country farmer having no idea what he just said. But then there's some gags that are just like kind of abstract or come right out of nowhere. Like when Lyle, the old farmer who lives across the road from Napoleon, just blows a cow's head off in front of a busload of kids. You're obviously expecting the cow to get its head blown off because it is set up, but you're not expecting it to play out in the way that it does. And then right as the kids are screaming, it just cuts to Napoleon doing his, like, happy hands club thing. And there are no other jokes in this movie that are remotely like this. It's so morbid, yet so hilarious. It's probably my favorite overall gag in the entire movie. I get the feeling Jared Hess probably had this happen to him when he was a kid. Napoleon Dynamite doesn't so much have a linear story. It's more so just a collection of scenes leading the movie from its start point to its end point. And that's really all it needs to be. Well, Napoleon is the focus character, it does have kind of an ensemble feel to it. Like, all the characters have their own little arc, but it doesn't let itself get caught up in a deeper story. I guess Napoleon's arc is he finally made some friends, kind of made himself look cool in front of the school, etc. Pedro's arc is becoming school president against all odds, and Rico's arc is being a shitbag and getting his comeuppance for it. I think all in all, by being more loose with the story, it lets us get to know the characters better. We see their quirks, their personality traits, and that, in and of itself, manages to propel the story in a forward fashion. It has its ups, it has its downs, and while it mirrors some aspect of a typical teen comedy of the era, it manages to kind of subvert a lot of those expectations. And because it's such a loose story, this is a movie that's very easy to drop in and out of, but it should be digested in full at least once once. I think Napoleon Dynamite is, like, pretty much a perfect movie. It's my favorite comedy of all time, just ahead of Clerks, but there is one thing I don't really like about the movie, and it's the big climax. The dance scene was really popular. I don't like it. It felt like they didn't know how to conclude the movie, so they were just like, well, let's set up Napoleon getting into funk dancing or whatever, and then at the end, when Pedro can't make his speech, he dances, and you think it's gonna bomb, but it doesn't. I understand why it's here. It's to show that Napoleon's kind of coming out of his weird shell, and I don't hate this scene. I do like how he seems to not believe in himself and even runs off before he can receive his standing ovation from the crowd. But I don't know, maybe it's because a lot of people were always like, oh yeah, the Napoleon dance, like when I was like growing up. I don't know, I just, this scene, not my favorite scene. I think they probably could have come up with something a little funnier, but nevertheless. It goes without saying that Napoleon Dynamite is one of my favorite movies of all time, and I place it slightly above Clerks, as mentioned, as one of my favorite comedy movies of all time. Which is funny because I tend to attach myself to more raunchy, dark, or even adult comedy movies, and Napoleon Dynamite, while not really a kid's movie, it is very suitable for families because everyone who worked on it is a Mormon. And Mormons don't really do vulgarity or raunchiness, and you know what? That's okay. If something is funny, it's funny even if it's clean and it's not totally clean there are some implications in the movie like Rico offering a 16 year old girl breast enlargement and yeah it's to like sabotage Napoleon but it's still fucking weird and then there's the Starla bit which I don't know if Starla is supposed to be transgender or a cis woman who did a lot of steroids or whatever and it doesn't really portray the relationship as negative but it seems like slightly teetering on like discriminatory it's probably the one joke in the movie that has aged aged kind of poorly. If Starla is supposed to be a trans woman, I can see some of the more modern viewers not really appreciating the joke that quote, haha, he's dating a trans woman, end quote. All I really have to say about that joke is you gotta remember a lot has changed in 20 years. Napoleon Dynamite was picked up by Fox Searchlight after it premiered at the 2004 Sundance Film Festival in January of that year. So technically the 20th anniversary was in January, but fuck it. Fox Searchlight, MTV, and Paramount all went in on distribution, with Searchlight releasing it domestically and MTV slash Paramount doing so overseas. Napoleon Dynamite was given a very limited theatrical release. I remember in 2004, it was the summer right when grade 7 was ending, and my friend Andrew came up to me and was like, hey, there's this movie called Napoleon Dynamite coming out, we should go see it. When I was younger, I had this problem where if something wasn't familiar to me, I was dismissive of it. I think a lot of people actually had that problem when they were younger, and some people still have that problem today because nobody wants to really give anything a chance in the theater anymore unless it's like a big franchise, and even those are starting to get the shaft. But Andrew was persistent. Andrew would not shut the fuck up about this movie. He saw a trailer on TV one day and he fucking like recorded it. 
I still wasn't completely convinced, like, yeah, I thought the movie looked funny, but I was like, eh. But then one day, after school, I was sitting at home, just flipping channels. It was like 4.30 in the afternoon, so The Simpsons didn't start until like 5. And I landed on much music. Now, typically, back in the day, if there was nothing to really watch on television, you would watch much music to see some music videos, you would watch CP24 to get some news, or you would just leave it on the TV Guide channel. Much music just so happened to be airing, like, a making of featurette on Napoleon Dynamite. And I figured, okay, I guess I'll watch this because I was familiar with it at that point because Andrew had showed me the trailer. Upon watching this, I kind of understood the movie more going into it, and I was immediately interested. Much of the problem with Napoleon Dynamite, at least from a marketing standpoint, I think was the fact that it's really hard to describe what the movie is, and I'm gonna get more into that later. But seeing the trailer from Andrew's videotape and then watching the making of documentary kind of of, you know, it got me informed. I was able to understand it enough to the point where I was like, okay, I kind of get this. I'll check it out. I remember asking my mom, hey, me and my friend want to see this movie. This was around when my parents first started letting me do shit on my own, like going out by myself and whatnot. And, you know, it's safe to say Napoleon Dynamite was the first movie that I saw, like, without parents or anything. It was the first time I went out to see a movie with a friend by myself. I distinctly remember being at the now-closed bus terminal restaurant at Coxville and Danforth and pulling out the newspaper to see where it was playing and what time and much to my shock this movie was not listed fucking anywhere. I didn't understand the concept of a limited release like as far as I was concerned at 12 years old like if a movie was out a movie was out most theaters probably had it but no none of the big movie theaters in Toronto had Napoleon Dynamite. The only theater that was playing this movie the first few weeks that it was out was the Carlton Cinema which was this like little rinky dink movie theater just off Young Street, which for those who aren't familiar with Toronto is like our downtown core street. The Carlton usually ran like indie films, second run movies, and documentaries. Like the actual screen and theater that we saw it in was like smaller than any theater I'd ever seen in my life. And it was practically empty. It was myself, Andrew, this one other guy, and this weird old guy who kept walking into the theater, like looking at the screen for a second and leaving. It was a weird feeling being in an empty theater but like that's always more fun when the theater's a little bit empty because like you can be a little bit louder than you can be in like a full theater and like you can kind of talk even though we didn't like talk over the movie it certainly was an experience to have seen this movie before anybody knew what the fuck it was Andrew and I, like, love this movie, and we talked about it for the last few weeks of school, and we were the only people who knew about it, and nobody at our school knew what the fuck we were referencing. Napoleon Dynamite was dumped into theaters, probably with the expectation that it would make at least its budget and a little bit extra back, and be a weird niche movie. Yeah, that's not what happened at all. Napoleon Dynamite started to do very well at the box office, even with its limited release. It got to a point where they couldn't really ignore it anymore, and they decided to give it a much wider release than it had initially gotten. That same summer, around August, I went to the States to visit my extended family. And that year I saw two movies in the theater with my uncle. One was Alien vs. Predator, and the other was Napoleon Dynamite for the second time. I wasn't shocked that my uncle was aware of Napoleon Dynamite, because he's always into, like, weird indie shit. Like, that's, like, his thing. So I was like, oh yeah, of course AJ knows what the fuck Napoleon Dynamite is. Like, I wasn't aware that it was performing at the box office and getting good reviews. I saw the movie, like, near the end of the school year. Nobody else I knew saw it, and now, hey, I was in the States, I was thinking it was gonna be at some small-ass theater like the one I saw it at for the first time. But much to my surprise, the second time I saw this movie in the middle of August, it was at a big multiplex with several different screens playing the movie, and at least my theater was fucking packed to the gills. Despite this movie receiving limited advertising and a limited release, it somehow managed to catch on. I don't really know how, I'm guessing a combination of word of mouth and good reviews, elements of both perhaps? Maybe they ramped up the advertising as soon as the movie started to actually pull money at the box office? But yeah, they started putting this movie in multiplexes and it made a fucking killing. By the end of its theatrical run, Napoleon Dynamite had made $46 million against its $400,000 budget. And it would 
likely continue making, like, ridiculous amounts of money because it was released on home video during Christmas of 2004. When I first saw this movie in the theater, it was a cool, exclusive, low-key thing that only myself and a few people that I knew were aware of. It started to get a little bit more popular with its theatrical expansion, but I still didn't know a lot of people that had seen this movie over the summer. But when it dropped on home video and rentals, like, holy shit. I remember coming back from Christmas break in 2005, because, you know, Christmas break goes over the new year, and I started seeing kids who looked at me weird for quoting this movie and, like, bringing it up, now dropping lines from the movie like it was going out of style. I am, like, dead serious when I say every fucking kid around my age range got this movie for Christmas in 2004. Unless it was, like, the one Jewish kid I went to school with, he probably got it for, like, Hanukkah or something. I don't want to sound like a hipster douchebag or, like, Millhouse but I had a weird feeling about this movie getting popular. It's smug and probably a little bit childish of me, but I do genuinely like being able to say, yeah, I saw Napoleon Dynamite before it got popular. I saw it on opening weekend. You probably only saw it on home video. Asshole. I think the issue with this is kind of similar to what happened with A Christmas Story and other kind of culty independent comedies that end up finding a massive audience. I started to get worn out. It wasn't really cool anymore because it wasn't a situation where it was just me and my select group of friends that were aware of this movie. Everybody was saying, TD, you fat lard, come get some dinner. Or like, everybody in gym class would grab a football and be like, I bet you I could throw a football over the mountains. I think the thing is, all these kids were experiencing what I experienced months before, and I had kind of just like, you know, moved past it. I was like, yeah, Napoleon Dynamite was awesome. But hey, there's other shit to watch. Since these kids obviously didn't see the movie when it first came out, and you know, they were seeing it for the first time when I had already moved past it, it was irritating. Because again, it's like, oh yeah, you said, you know, that movie looked like it sucked when I brought it up. I had moved past it, but I was more than happy to own it on, I think I had it on VHS, I got it for Christmas that year. I think what it was also was I kind of felt like Bart with the earring when I showed up back to school after Christmas break. It's like, great, everybody's quoting Napoleon Dynamite now. I know, you know, me being mad that this movie wasn't cool and exclusive anymore, is like diet gatekeeping or whatever. And I didn't like give people shit or anything. I wasn't like, oh, you didn't see it when it first came out. I got in on it because, hey, whatever, now I can relate to more people, but I have to admit, everybody knowing what this movie was and everybody referencing it did kind of kill the fun of finding it. It's nuts, because Napoleon Dynamite blowing up the way it did meant that more things were made to cash in on it. Merchandise, Halloween costumes, etc. And I think that kind of added to me becoming jaded about the movie. And don't get me wrong, I don't resent the fact that the movie got popular. I am happy that it got popular. I'm happy that it was a success, especially for Jared Hess and the rest of those involved. I'm very happy for them that this little movie they made in rural Idaho basically was able to launch pad all of them into a fucking career in the industry. I'm just a little bit disappointed that it burned really bright and then burned the fuck out, which we'll get to that in a little bit. Another thing that really killed the fun of this movie for me was the fact that during my grade 8 trip to Quebec, we had a television on the bus and we watched this movie five times on the way to and from Quebec City. Multiple people brought movies for this trip and it would be like, okay kids, what do we want to watch? And like, uh, many times the whole bus would be like, Napoleon Dynamite! After that, I made a vow. I didn't actually ever want to get sick of this movie. Comedy movies tend to wear thin faster than any other kind of movie, and even at that age, I wanted to still be able to watch this and laugh at it, so I made the vow to just avoid it in order to preserve my perception of it. After the Grade 8 trip to Quebec, I avoided this movie for seven years before I watched it again, and then when it finally did watch it again, it was like it was brand fucking new. And honestly, since then, I've maybe watched it three times in the past decade. And the benefit to doing that is every time I watch Watch this movie, I can fall in love with it all over again. However, this comes at somewhat of a price. This movie was so overwhelmingly popular when I was in middle school in 2004-2005. As I mentioned, it burned really bright, but then it just burned the fuck out. Nowadays, outside of people who are around my age, this movie really does fall under the radar. I know very few people younger than my 
age group who have actually ever seen this movie. It's a strange feeling, especially considering that this was once the hottest fucking movie in the world. And I get it, things change through the generations. Not every movie that was important to you is going to be important to the generation that follows. Some of the people I know who aren't even that much younger than I was when this movie came out just simply don't get the movie. They think, oh, it's a little bit funny. They just don't get that same hype level that we had back in the day. And I think that has to do with the fact that this movie does get hyped up a lot by people around my age and like everybody's like, oh, it's probably this really hilarious movie. But then they put it on and it's such like a quaint, low-key movie. Like, if you were somebody who avoided this movie and you just heard it getting hyped all the time and then you were like, fine, I'm finally gonna watch it, you likely would be let down. And I think part of the reason why younger generations might not like it as much, at least, you know, based on the ones I've met, is they maybe cannot identify with the quirkiness of the movie in general. I hate to really say this, but I think Napoleon Dynamite is 100% a you-really-had-to-be-there type of movie. You really just had to be there. And that's not to say the movie, you know, doesn't hold up today. You could probably show it to, like, your younger sibling, cousin, or if you're a little bit older, your kids, and they might enjoy it. But it's definitely not going to be for everyone. That's the problem with Napoleon Dynamite being such a unique experience as a comedy film. People who weren't there for it are probably just not going to connect with it. It's pretty much safe to say that Napoleon Dynamite is a unique entity that arrived at the right place at the right time. This was right when gross-out comedies had worn their welcome out, and quirky character comedies like Anchorman, 40-Year-Old Virgin, and Napoleon Dynamite were starting to become the trend. While Napoleon Dynamite is the vision of a young director basing a lot of it on his experiences, it did manage to fit perfectly into this new era of comedy and become a massive hit because of it. And yeah, I'm I'm gonna go ahead and say it, it's been 20 years and because I've avoided this movie and preserved my memories of it, I still love this movie all the same. I'm not burned out on it at all. Sure, there are the odd few things that I don't find as funny now as I did back then and I talked about how I thought the dance thing was a little bit corny, but my statement still stands. Like, if I was to make an independent movie, like, I would base, like, how I made it off of Napoleon Dynamite. I would definitely look to Napoleon Dynamite for inspiration because what Jared had did here with just $400,000 was nothing short of a miracle. And now look at him, he's gonna be making the Minecraft movie, which could potentially make hundreds of millions of dollars. I think it's funny though that this movie is so quirky and unique that it actually had an effect on modern cinema. It's insane to think about it, but Napoleon Dynamite has led to the creation of a term known as the Napoleon Dynamite problem. And this can be applied to like other quirky movies like Eternal Sun. Sunshine or I Heart Huckabees. Essentially, something like Napoleon Dynamite makes it difficult for algorithms to predict if someone would like another film, because Napoleon Dynamite is such a bizarre and unique movie. There's nothing like it. It's very specific, but non-specific at the same time. It's hard to explain. Like, a movie like Billy Madison is a movie that you'd probably easily be able to say, like, hey, if you liked Billy Madison, you'd probably like Happy Gilmore or Joe Dirt. But with Napoleon Dynamite, it's like, hey, if you like Napoleon Dynamite, you probably like, um, ah, shit. There are no movies that you can really compare to Napoleon Dynamite because it is so unique. The only movie that has any sort of similarity to Napoleon Dynamite just off the top of my head, and this is still fractional, is Eagle vs. Shark. Not quality-wise, obviously. Like, I liked Eagle vs. Shark, but it's nowhere near the same level as Napoleon Dynamite. But the fact that the only movie I can slightly compare to Napoleon Dynamite is Taika Waititi's first movie, this obscure romantic comedy, shows just how truly unique Napoleon Dynamite is. It's legacy still lives on even if not as many people really are into the movie as they were 20 years ago. It's not like Ghostbusters where it's just like being franchised, which please don't ever franchise this fucking movie. <laughs> Although I really don't see how they could fucking franchise this movie. I mean, there's not, it's, it doesn't really have a plot. Like I mentioned this earlier, like part of the uniqueness about it is that the movie is without a solid story. Its plot is its character arcs, which kind of contributes to making it hard to explain to somebody who hasn't seen it. So if for some reason you haven't seen the movie and you've watched my entire video up to this point, go and watch the movie because nothing I'm describing here can give you the impression that watching the movie can give you. John Hedder was obviously the one who benefited
benefited the most from this movie, especially early on. Like, sure, a lot of the actors had an uptick in stock, but John Hedder started getting those big summer and holiday comedies out of it for a couple years after this movie came out. Jared Hess would go on to do more movies, such as Nacho Libre, which was a pretty big hit, but he would never really reach that same level that Napoleon Dynamite reached. I haven't seen the movies he did after Nacho Libre. I'm sure they're, like, good or at least competently made, but it's kind of sad that Napoleon Dynamite was his magnum opus, and it was the first feature he ever did. With Napoleon Dynamite being as hot as it was, you'd think they would spring to do a sequel or the aforementioned spin-off about Kip or something, but no, they were pretty good. And that's really shocking about Kip, because they did these TV spots when the movie started to get popular, titled Napoleon Goes to Hollywood, and they were very Kip-centric, like he had become some big rap icon in Hollywood after the events of the movie. These were purely to advertise the movie, but no, they knew that they had something with the Kip character, but they just didn't act on it. Maybe it's because Jared Hess didn't want to do it, maybe Aaron Rule didn't want to do it, but they 100% could have done something with the Kip character within a year year or two of the release of Napoleon Dynamite, and it probably would have gone over pretty well, at least from a box office perspective. But they chose not to. Maybe that's just not what they wanted. Maybe there was a point in time where these guys just wanted to make a movie and then it happened to be a hit. I guess they were happy with what they got, and they didn't try to do anything else with it until about 2012, when Fox Sundays was going through a bit of a crisis following the conclusion of King of the Hill. Yeah, Fox went through a bit of a thing where they were really trying to fill in, like, that time slot after King of the Hill ended, and one of those attempts was an animated series based on Napoleon Dynamite. I didn't really watch it, didn't really care to watch it, I, it was like a little bit too late for me. What I've seen of it just kind of reminds me of like a poor man's Beavis and Butthead. It wasn't good, but I appreciate that they got pretty much everyone from the movie back for it, but it just wasn't meant to be, it got cancelled after one season. And now in recent years there have been talks of a Napoleon Dynamite sequel coming out. Jared Hess has stated he wants to take Napoleon Dynamite and put it in a bit of a darker tone movie where they're all older and different looking and things may or may not be going well in their lives. And you know what, I'll, you know, fuck it, I'll see it if it comes out. 20 years later, Napoleon Dynamite, for the most part, still holds up, especially if you were from that generation. Sure, it's kind of fallen out of the public view from what I can tell, but it will always be beloved to me and the generation wise. I personally think it is one of the most important films of my generation. It's inspiring. Not the movie itself, but the fact that Jared has bet on himself and came out extremely successful. If you haven't seen Napoleon Dynamite and you're around my age, I'm gonna assume that you were in a cave on Mars with your eyes eyes shut and your fingers in your ears. And if you haven't seen it and you're younger or even older than me, I'd say check it out. You might not like it the same way that I do, but I am curious to know what people who weren't there for it actually think of it seeing it for the first time 20 years later. If you go out and watch it, drop me a comment, let me know your thoughts on this movie because I need to know. I need to know if I'm making this movie out to be a bigger deal than it is because of how important it is to my coming of age, but I would also like to see the perspective of people who weren't there or who missed out. So with that being said, happy 20th anniversary to an era-defining comedy. Like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon for more shit, I guess. Later. I see you're drinking 1%. Is that because you think you're fat? Tina, come get some ham. Just got a T.O. I guess you could say things are getting pretty serious. Do the chickens have large talon ta talons? Yes. Are you serious? I'm Mitchers. Are you serious? I'm Mitchers. He's a sledgehammer. That's what I'm talking about. Are you serious? I'm Mitchers. Idiot. I guess I did. Lucky. I like her bangs. Her real bad. Looks like a medieval warrior. I'm making some sweet moolah with Uncle Rico. Peace out.